Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this joint Eurogen Ernica webinar. My name is Olivia Spivak, and I'm a project manager for Ernica. Before I hand over to our speakers for today, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a bit more about the ERNs. So ERNs are European reference networks, um, and they're networks of hospitals and patient organisations from across Europe working together to support patients with rare and complex diseases, their families and healthcare professionals. This is done by pooling together expertise, knowledge and resources from across Europe. The ERNs were set up in 2017 by the European Commission, and each network is focused on a different rare and or complex disease area. Two ERNs have teamed up to set up this webinar today, and that's Eurogen, the European Reference Network for Rare and Complex Urogenital Conditions, and Ernica, which is the European Reference Network for Rare Inherited Congenital Anomalies. And it's titled Pediatric Pseudo Obstruction, or PEPO, Current Workup. The main presenter for today is Nikhil Tapar from Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane. But as it's around 2 a.m. for him at the moment in Australia, the webinar is pre-recorded and questions will be answered by Mark Benninger from Amsterdam University Medical Center. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor back to Luz to begin the presentation. Hello. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today, and I would like to thank the organizers of the ERN Eurogen webinar series for the very kind invitation to speak. My name is Nikhil Thapra. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, uh, currently based in the most western of the European states, uh, otherwise known as Australia. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person, um, but it is a real pleasure and honor for me to be joined by my dear friend and colleague, Professor Mark Benninger. I'm sure he is known to all of you, one of the most eminent experts uh, in pediatric motility disorders, and he will kindly take questions at the end of the presentation. We've been asked to talk on pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction. There are no conflicts of interest. Now, all of you will be familiar with the term chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction. And this is defined by the failure of the gastrointestinal tract to propel its contents through an otherwise unobstructed lumen. In other words, signs and symptoms of a mechanical obstruction, but in the absence uh, of an actual mechanical cause. So therefore, these conditions really relate to a failure of the uh, neuromusculature to be able to propel the contents. And therefore, right at the outset, we are dealing with a very heterogeneous group of disorders because the enteric neuromusculature is uh, made up of uh, complex interactions between nerves, between muscles, between interstitial cells of Cahal. All of these are modulated. If you affect any of these, either primarily or through the modulating pathways, then you will end up with a severe motility disorder of the small intestine and this picture of chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction. So therefore, when we look at the definition, the main criteria we use for the diagnosis, diagnosis of chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction are three main ones traditionally. Firstly, symptoms and signs of intestinal obstruction. Uh, secondly, the absence of an obvious mechanical cause. And thirdly, the presence of a dilated gut with air fluid levels. <clears throat> now, these criteria are used in adult practice. So therefore, the diagnosis of chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction is very much based on these clinical criteria. However, is the picture in children the same as adults? Well, as I will go on to sh uh, show you, um, we know that especially in the main age of presentation in the first couple of months of life, that in children, you may not actually have a dilated gut with air fluid levels. We also know that in children, as opposed to adults, the vast majority are of course going to present within the first few months of life, and the etiopathogenesis is congenital, predominantly as opposed to acquired, which is the picture that we see within adults. So in adults, it may be secondary to things like malignancy and 
um, the involvement of the gut occurs secondary to this, where in children it is primary involvement of the gut neuromusculature and it occurs as a congenital cause. We also know that in children the condition appears to be rapidly progressive and therefore the use of parental nutrition, for example, is much higher. There is a considerable overlap with the other causes of feeding disorders, so therefore there needs to be a clear separation of pseudo obstruction from other causes uh, of feeding difficulties. We know that there may be an element of fabricated induced illness and therefore one needs a definitive diagnosis and really in pediatric practice that has really meant um, that we use definitive diagnostic testing such as monometry uh, which is not really used within adult practice. So therefore, although traditionally we have considered that chronic intestinal pseudobstruction is really a spectrum across the ages, we now recognize that it is a very different entity in children as opposed to adults. Uh, hence, in 2018, a consensus uh, of uh, experts within this field suggested that we no longer refer to chronic intestinal pseudobstruction in children. However, we call it a distinct entity which we now refer to as pediatric intestinal pseudo-obstruction or PIPO or PIPO. Now the expert uh, consensus I refer to is a joint effort um, led by the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, but really involving experts from across uh, the United uh, States uh, and Europe, as well as Canada, um, and this includes not only pediatric gastroenterologists, but experts in pediatric surgery and transplantation, as well as adult uh, experts in gastroenterology surgery and histopathology. And I will refer to the recommendations from this expert group, which was really formulated because we, we understood that there was a great variability in the diagnosis and approach to management across the world. So how did we define pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction? Well, very similar to that of chronic intestinal pseudobstruction. So clearly this is still an inability of the gastrointestinal tract to propel its contents, and therefore it mimics mechanical obstruction, but occurs in the absence of any lesion occluding the gut. Of course, there's a chronicity there. We know that especially in the newborn period, especially in premature infants, there may be a transient pseudobstructive picture so therefore chronicity we defined as persistence for two months from birth or occurring at least six months thereafter. We looked to identify clear diagnostic criteria. Of course, uh, these are children with a picture of uh, intestinal obstruction. You have basically excluded a mechanical uh, cause and we suggested that there be at least two out of four uh, diagnostic criteria that need to be met in order to make this diagnosis. Now, of course, the, the first criteria, which is met by pretty much all children or should be met by all children, is an inability to maintain adequate nutrition and or growth on oral feeding. So this really recognizes the fact that uh, children with pseudo-obstruction are needing specialized enteral nutrition or parental nutrition support. But of course, we also know of many other conditions in which oral nutrition or the need to support children with specialized enteral nutrition or parental nutrition is required. So by itself, it is inadequate. The second criterion therefore is akin to adult practice is the presence of recurrent or persistently dilated small intestinal loops with air fluid levels. But again, as I will go on to see, this is not present in all children presenting with in, in early life. So therefore we added a third criterion, and this is an objective measure of small intestinal neuromuscular involvement. Now in pediatrics, we would uh, tend to use monometry, histopathology is widely used. Transit studies are, are still are utilized for parts of the gastrointestinal tract, but still need to be validated. The final criterion we put on was that um, of a genetic, metabolic, or other abnormality, which is known to be definitively associated with intestinal pseudo-obstruction. And what do I mean by that? Well, we know of particular genetic uh, mutations um, or mitochondrial disorders that are associated with a picture of pediatric intestinal pseudo-obstruction. 
Um, so therefore, we now recognize a large number of genes. I should say at the outset that uh, still uh, this would only be seen in a minority of conditions, maybe 10% or so of all children with intestinal pseudo-obstruction. And these include genes which affect um, the formation of the nervous system, the function and structure of the nervous system, as well as the muscles and interstitial cells in, of Cajal. More recently, there's been a lot of attention um, on the ACTG2 gene and also on filament A. And we recognize that within these genetic um, the conditions that there is a great a deal of variability. So, of course, if we identify this with a clinical picture of intestinal pseudobstruction, this makes the diagnosis much more likely. We also recognize that you may have a, an inflammatory component. So, in a small proportion of children on full thickness biopsies, we know that they may have an inflammatory component and therefore the neuromusculature is involved secondary to this with uh, damage or destruction of uh, ganglia within the gut or the muscle layers, uh, either through eosinophilic ganglionitis or through a more diffuse inflammatory process involving cells such as lymphocytes. There are a number of secondary causes. These, again, uh, would form the minority uh, of cases of pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction, but they would include rheumatological conditions, uh, conditions affecting the uh, musculature generally within the body, so the muscular dystrophies, um, pathologies affecting the enteric nervous uh, system, the inherent nervous system of the gut, especially looking at post-viral uh, inflammatory neuropathies. We, of course, recognize um, viruses such as cytomegalovirus and varicella zoster virus that can uh, present with uh, damage um, and the picture of intestinal pseudobstruction. In adult practice, um, they have recognized other uh, viruses uh, such as the JC virus. And of course, there's endocrine causes such as hypothyroidism, metabolic causes, and other um, conditions which in a minority may also present with a picture of pseudobstruction, um, such as involvement in celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease. How common is intestinal pseudobstruction? Well, it's extremely rare. In a survey done in the United States many years ago, the suggested incidence was approximately one per 40,000 uh, live births. However, more recently in um, population-based uh, studies, uh, the suggested prevalence is much, much lower, um, really with a suggested prevalence of something like one in 250,000 children. So we don't really know what the exact incidence is across the world and in Europe specifically, um, but we think it'll be something in the order of about one in 100,000 to one in 300,000. And it appears to have an equal sex incidence. In terms of clinical picture, the vast majority of children are going to present um, as co congenital disorders. So therefore, in about 20%, you might see uh, get prenatal signs. This is largely through prenatal ultrasounds, which might show a dilated urinary uh, tract or dilated um, gastrointestinal tract. Um, about 50 to 70% of patients are going to present within the first month of life, and certainly the vast majority by the first year of life with the remainder uh, really misdiagnosis, which presents sporadically in the first two decades of life. In terms of clinical picture, of course, the clinical picture is going to be one of intestinal pseudobstruction without a mechanical cause. Therefore, not surprisingly, the commonest presentation is going to be of a child with significant abdominal distension. Often it can be quite marked compared to uh, even a mechanical obstruction. There is vomiting, which is often bilious. Constipation is extremely common. Uh, failure to thrive occurs in about 50%. It is often underdiagnosed because, of course, weight is a poor measure um, of failure to thrive, given that these children retain lots of fluid within dilated intestinal loops. But one of the hallmarks is really, uh, compared to a mechanical obstruction, is the absence of abdominal pain. Um, so therefore, we really see this only in a minority of patients So the classical big distended abdomen, bilious vomiting, constipation, but relatively little abdominal pain, which is often 
present when there is more of a mechanical issue uh, that develops within these children, for example, with adhesions. So therefore, we should suspect a diagnosis of uh, people uh, where there is a prenatal diagnosis of um, involvement of the urinary tract or a postnatal uh, diagnosis where you both have intestinal uh, obstruction and bladder dysmotility. And of course, the muscle coats in both the intestine and bladder are similar in that they are smooth muscle. You should suspect it where there is persistent recurrent obstruction after exclusion of Hirschsprung's. And it's, it's really mandatory to exclude Hirschsprung's disease because this can be a presentation where there is more extensive um, small intestinal bowel involvement or if there's uh, other conditions like hypothyroidism. In about 30% of cases, you will see malrotation within patients with pseudobstruction, both with neuropathic and myopathic disease. However, if after a corrective procedure like a LADS procedure, you continue to see persistent obstructive symptoms, then this is also when you need to consider whether pseudobstruction is present. And finally, where if intestinal obstruction is associated with something which uh, suggests a more syndromic problem like ptosis, deafness, or abnormalities in cardiac rhythm or function, then this may uh, increase your suspicion of intestinal pseudoobstruction. What about the role of diagnostic and in, uh, investigative modalities um, for intestinal pseudoobstruction? Of course, the majority of patients are going to get a plain uh, abdominal x-ray. And we know that in the majority of cases, you will see dilatation uh, of part of the gastrointestinal tract. However, if we look at the classical picture of dilated um, gut with air fluid levels, then we know um, that although it is present in almost all children after the, knee, the first couple of months of life, it can be present in a smaller proportion during the neonatal period. So some studies suggesting only 57% of patients during the neonatal period. And in some studies, in the 18 patients with no dilatation, 16 of them were under the age of two months. Now remember that this is the main time when children will present. So therefore it's not a very reliable um, clinical sign. So therefore we recommended that of course, uh, a abdominal radiography should be routinely used in all patients suspected of pseudo obstruction. Uh, to identify these dilated small intestinal loops with air fluid levels. Um, those air fluid levels are better visualized in an upright position. However, they may not be seen in young adults. And importantly, they don't differentiate functional from mechanical obstruction. What does differentiate it are contrast studies. So therefore, uh, we recommend that a small bowel follow-through contrast study should be carried out. We recommend that this should be water soluble. Uh, in case of retention of the contrast uh, agent, which can occur in a pseudo obstruction, and that this is very useful to exclude an organic lesion, such as um, uh, a gut occlusion or a malrotation. It also can be useful to assess the extent of intestinal dilatation, but it is not a marker of intestinal transit. So therefore, even in the worst pseudo obstruction, the transit can be quite fast, and therefore it cannot be used to actually assess transit through the bowel. As far as other transit studies, they don't really have a, a, a role or have not been validated, including radiopaque marker studies, breath tests, uh, and the wireless capsule. Um, however, gastric scintigraphies or measures of gastric emptying um, should be performed in the diagnostic workup. Many of these children have uh, gastroparesis. And currently, um, we are looking to see whether we can better validate the use of small bowel and colonic transit. And indeed, very recently, we published a study where we were looking at the utility of uh, nuclear medicine, so small intestinal scintigraphy. Uh, we compared this in controls versus patients with pseudoobstruction. And of course, part of the problem about the small intestine is that it's not a fixed uh, organ, and therefore using regions of interest that are fixed, such as the stomach, the cecum, uh, and the whole abdomen, we were able to show that in pseudo obstruction, you were able to use small intestinal scintigraphy to differentiate between patients with pseudo obstruction and control patients, and especially so if they had a myopathic pseudo obstruction. Now, this remains to be validated, but it does tell us 
that we may be able to start to use scintigraphy at least as a screening uh, tool when we consider patients with pseudo obstruction. Um, imaging has really um, come of age. Uh, CINE MRI is a modality um, which is much more accessible now. So there is data now uh, where uh, individuals, is, even in pediatrics, are now beginning to collect data on motility based on uh, CINE MRI, uh, which is non-invasive. It doesn't involve radiation. And in fact, from the adult literature, it is able to differentiate uh, individuals with intestinal pseudo-obstruction uh, from controls, and people have even um, used meals, uh, the addition of meals to better differentiate between patients with pseudo obstruction and uh, controls. However, the main um, method that is used for the definitive diagnosis of intestinal pseudo obstruction is manometry, um, so antrodudine or small intestinal uh, manometry. In our hands, we place this using interventional radiology. So you're placing a specialized uh, catheter uh, with the tip beyond the DJ uh, flexure with some ports present within the stomach as well. And we then attach this to a manometry equipment. And this allows us to give uh, contractile profiles. And here we can see an, an example of a low um, resolution, a small in, intestinal manometry uh, profile. Here we can see the very large uh, contractions of the gastric antrum occurring at about three cycles per minute. And then we have this very coordinated propagation of phase, what we call phase three activity or migrating motor complex um, down the intestine in a normal individual. And with the advent of high resolution manometry, we uh, have better resolution, although this is much more complicated than the profiles that we see, for example, in the esophagus. This is an example of a patient. We can see here that the amplitude of the contractions is very small, but you get a very highly coordinated contraction here. There are abnormal features here, such as an elevation of the baseline, the small amplitude, uh, and this is very classical picture of what you might see in a myopathic pseudobstruction. This is what you might see in a neuropathic. So there's no predominant waveform which is um, moving down the small intestine, um, although the amplitude of contraction is normal. And in fact, having some amount of propagation, such as we see here, is quite useful in considering management strategies such as prokinetic uh, agents. So we do use those to try and decide whether um, these agents should be used. And we have a good understanding of what abnormalities might look like on a manometry. Um, more recently, we have tried to incorporate all of the contractile findings to improve the utility of antrodudine or manometry um, for the diagnosis of pediatric intestinal pseudo-obstruction, including the development of a scoring system, which we refer to as the GLASS scoring system, although this remains to be validated in larger studies. So therefore we recommend that um, antrodidine manometry should really be performed in all children um, with a suspected diagnosis of pseudo obstruction in order not only to confirm the diagnosis and separate this out from non pseudo obstructive disorders, including fabricated illness, but to clarify the pathophysiology. Uh, it's important to know, is this a neuropathy? Is it a myopathy, which has a much poorer prognosis and also to help optimize clinical management. We also suggested the manometry of uh, other parts of the gastrointestinal tract, such as the esophagus and colon may also be considered. What about histopathology? This has really been enhanced with the ability to access tissue. So therefore using laparoscopic assisted um, techniques, we can get good amounts of tissue, although you can also get the tissue at the time of stoma formation, at the time of laparotomy to exclude a mechanical obstruction, you can get a good amount of tissue. You can uh, apply a specialized stains, electron uh, microscopy, and standard histopathology. Um, so for example, in this image here, you can see almost complete fibrous replacement of the muscle layers in a severe uh, myopathic intestinal pseudobstruction. And in fact, there are now international guidelines on histological techniques that should be applied um, in cases where you are suspecting a significant motility disorder. 
Of course, the reality is that the expertise um, is very variable. Um, so this is a study that looked across European and US pathology labs showing these very different approaches and variation in practice. The second uh, challenge is that even in the best centers, uh, many of the biopsies, and it could be even as high as 30 or 40% um, of the biopsies taken from individuals with pseudobstruction may actually be reported as of normal and of unclear significance. And the correlation with manometry is not always clear, although in our uh, um, enhanced interpretation of the antrogedinal manometry, we saw better correlation with histopathology. So it is not a perfect uh, technique. So we do recommend that full thickness tissue uh, should be taken for histopathology, uh, either um, when a, a stoma is being formed or when you are excluding a mechanical obstruction. The histopathological analysis should be performed in a reference center which has the expertise um, to look at a full neuromuscular series uh, and stains. And then it's really mandatory to exclude Hirschsprung's disease um, because we have seen cases of pseudobstruction, which are really where you have uh, more extensive intestinal involvement of Hirschsprung's disease. So an erectile biopsy is mandatory or an anorectal manometry in all the children. So therefore the diagnostic algorithm really says that if you see signs and symptoms of an intestinal obstruction, um, you initially exclude a mechanical cause if that's been excluded, this is a possible pseudo-obstruction. It may be supported by the clinical picture. And if it is, then you refer to a, a center which is able to carry out the proper diagnostic evaluation. I note there was a recent paper looking at the availability uh, on different techniques um, across Europe. And in, we certainly across most of the centers, um, many of the techniques are available. However, things like manometry um, still need to be made more available um, or need to be, um, or referrals need to go to reference centers in order to make a definitive diagnosis of pseudo-obstruction. So this is very much a work in progress. Now, finally, in terms of uh, management, well, unfortunately, there isn't any curative management uh, for pseudo-obstruction. So therefore, um, a lot of this is, uh, is palliative and supportive. Um, and really follows three main principles. Uh, firstly, to provide uh, nutrition to, in order to preserve growth and development of the children, um, using enteral nutrition where possible, uh, but most of the children are going to use parental nutrition. Secondly, to limit symptoms and progression of the disease, um, and also very importantly, to improve quality of life of these children. Um, which can be very poor unless this is managed properly. And this is through the use not only of medical and surgical approaches, but also the use of allied specialists uh, such as psychology to support the child and the family. And finally, and very importantly, um, because this is a major cause of morbidity and mortality, is the prevention of complications. Uh, so therefore addressing sepsis, bacterial overgrowth, and parental nutrition and central line related morbidities and complications. So therefore, not surprisingly, one of the uh, key recommendations that we made was that in children with pseudobstruction, remember this is a very rare disorder um, within the United Kingdom, for example, we were only expecting to see about 12 new diagnoses of pseudobstruction each year, is that these children really should be managed by a, uh, a hospital team, a dedicated hospital team, which is made up of multiple disciplines working together and working in partnership as well with community services, that this team should have a thorough knowledge of the condition and all of the available tools and requirements uh, for the diagnosis and management, because certainly in children with pseudobstruction, we're really looking to utilize on a personal level a, a range of different management strategies, and that is critically important. So in terms of a treatment algorithm, um, once you have confirmed the diagnosis of pseudobstruction, the first step is really nutrition before you go on to consider medical and surgical interventions. Now, why is nutrition so important? Well, of course, it's not only important in terms of growth and development, but we know that it's critically important 
for the maintenance and recovery of gut function. So we know that gut motility in children with pseudo obstruction will improve if you optimize nutritional support and it will decline if nutrition is not addressed appropriately. Now, although in most um, series of pseudo obstruction and described to date, they will be on a mix of enteral and parenteral nutrition, the vast majority have needed parenteral uh, nutrition and sometimes um, sole parenteral nutrition lifelong, for example, children with a myopathic pseudo obstruction. And all of the children have required some dietary modification, and I will talk about that in a minute. And the aim is really to maintain maximally tolerated enteral nutrition. However, to do so without compromising bowel function. So what you don't want to see is that the gut is getting more and more dilated and poor functioning with time, and you want to avoid bezoar formation. Now, this is a, an example of a, a classical algorithm that one might uh, use in managing pseudo obstruction in terms of nutrition. So it's really a stepwise approach. Um, and that is saying that initially you might try modifications of oral diet, such as the use of uh, liquids versus solids or low fiber solids. And then if this is insufficient, you might consider feeding into the stomach and uh, using continuous feeds, using hydrolysates. And again, if this is unsuccessful, then there's a jejunal uh, or jejunal feeding might be um, very uh, useful. And again, if these fail, then you're really you know, considering medical treatments before finally making a decision to go on to parenteral nutrition. And this is a paper that we very recently uh, published again, looking at a strategy for nutritional uh, support, um, really based on what you, your findings are in terms of antrodenal manometry and, and gastric emptying. And that if you have evidence of uh, a compromise of the small intestine, then you might start again with a liquid diet, low in fat, with low fermentable uh, carbohydrates, so whey based. Uh, formula. And however, if this is insufficient uh, and there is delayed gastric emptying, then you might need to change uh, the feed accordingly. Consider gastric feeding in terms of using small frequent boluses of continuous feeding. You might consider jejunal feeding. And then if, again, if this is not tolerated or, in, or insufficient, then that is when you might consider the use of partial or full parenteral uh, nutrition. And of course, parental nutrition has been one of the most important um, positive steps in children with intestinal pseudobstruction. It really transformed a, um, a life limiting condition in the sense that none of these children really survived beyond the first few years of life to actually giving them a very a good chance of survival. And in fact, survival rates with improvements in parental nutrition and central uh, line care have improved even beyond the figures that um, I'm showing uh, up here, and they appear to have the same health-related quality of life as healthy controls in the best centers. However, there are significant risk of complications, especially um, related uh, to the use of parental nutrition and central lines, and especially if children uh, have been diagnosed at a very young age, have a short bowel, and have myopathic disease. So what about pharmacotherapy? Well, unfortunately, sadly, um, drug treatments have not uh, proven to be that successful in children with pediatric uh, intestinal pseudobstruction. And really the therapeutic uh, role of drugs is mainly limited to prokinetics. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, suppression of bacterial overgrowth, which is almost universal within these children and the control of intestinal uh, inflammation where it is present. Now, in terms of pharmacotherapy, of course, if you're dealing with a severe myopathic pseudobstruction, such as I showed you earlier, where almost all of the muscle has been completely, um, which is completely abnormal, then the likelihood you are going to get success with a agent to improve um, or the uh, motility within the bowel, it's, it's unlikely. Um, there are agents, however, which have been used in uh, patients, especially with neuropathic pseudobstruction. Um, these include antibiotics with prokinetic properties, such as amoxicillin with clavulinate, um, azithromycin. Both of these have uh, motility properties uh, within the stomach and the small intestine. Um, serotonin agents like were, uh, cisapride were highly successful before they were withdrawn from the market. 
Uh, more recently, there's been some amount of success that has been reported, especially in adults um, with uh, pseudo obstruction. Um, but the mainstay has been agents uh, such as uh, octreotide. So in this study from the United States up at the top, um, they found success with the use of octreotide together with uh, uh, macrolides such as uh, uh, erythromycin in advancing enteral feeds in children with intestinal pseudo obstruction. And more recently, um, there has been reported uh, success with old agents uh, such as the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors in children with intestinal pseudo obstruction. Although, um, whether we can really use these agents in, um, through the duration of life um, in children is still a question, and some of the side effects are not tolerable. We know that if there is inflammation within the gut, then there may certainly be a place for addressing uh, the inflammation. So where there's ganglionitis or whether there is an inflammatory infiltrate, so the use of immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive uh, agents uh, may be of uh, significant value uh, within these patients. However, the mainstay of uh, treatment within pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction is going to be in surgery. So this uh, is not only to provide feeding, which is critically important, but very importantly to decompress the bowel by forming a venting ostomy. And this really, in a bowel that is not able to work efficiently, reduces the resistance to flow, reduces the chance that it is going to dilate up and further uh, compromise its function. And in fact, the, uh, the creation of venting ostomies is associated in a number of studies now by very positive outcomes of improving symptoms, reducing pseudo-obstructive episodes that ordinarily would require hospitalization. So therefore this reduces healthcare burden. It improves feed, in, uh, feed tolerance, especially where you have a neuropathic pseudo-obstruction. However, uh, the warning is that there is a high rate of stomal complications such as prolapse, obstruction, and the need for revision. Recently, there have been studies showing that a, a feeding device like a gastrogenostomy is not only valuable in terms of providing feed, but also in decompressing the more proximal uh, segments of the bowel, and that should be considered as well. So the recommendation from the expert group is really that we needed to consider in all patients with pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction, the formation of a venting feeding gastrostomy or a jejunostomy, the formation of a decompressive ileostomy in all children with pseudo-obstruction. Um, however, um, try to minimize the number of surgical intervention given the risk of complications such as adhesion formation is high within this group. What about transplantation? Well, this is really the only um, really curative uh, approach um, we have towards intestinal pseudo-obstruction. Um, this could be an isolated small bowel transplant or um, together uh, with the stomach as well, it carried out in a few centers uh, across the world. Now, if you were to ask me this uh, question uh, 15, 20 years ago, the outlook of children with intestinal pseudobstruction was abysmal. Uh, so the cumulative survival rate was very, very poor. I mean, this study from the United States, they showed that the majority of children actually um, didn't even get uh, to transplants and the outcomes are pretty poor thereafter. However, things have considerably improved in more recent years, um, showing that the cumulative survival is certainly uh, better. Uh, so in this US group, it, it showed um, long-term uh, survival rates in excess of 70-75%. Uh, um, however, um, graft survival can be a challenge. So therefore, the recommendation is that certainly intestinal transplantation uh, should be considered in pseudo-obstruction, especially in patients presenting with life-threatening um, uh, PN-associated complications with central venous catheter complications such as thrombosis or line sepsis, where there is a poor quality of life with a very high risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, and what we really suggested is an early dialogue with the transplant center. And I do wonder whether this has been the real change in survival um, is really this early dialogue and optimal timing of the transplant. Although the use of parenteral nutrition is really um, now 
almost paralleled um, the success of transplantation. What about outcomes? Well, um, there is still very poor outcomes. 80% um, uh, or so need parental uh, uh, nutrition, that should say parental nutrition support, and 10 to 25% a percent are still going to die before adulthood. And unfortunately, even if you look at recent data, for example, this study from China published recently, the overall survival rate was still very abysmal at about 60%. Um, so therefore, this is, is still a very devastating disease. So therefore, what are my take-home messages with regards to pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction? Um, this is a rare condition. It is uh, consistent of a very heterogeneous group of disorders with a severe clinical outcome. Um, we now refer to pediatric intestinal pseudobstruction as a distinct entity um, from what we see within adults. Uh, diagnosis um, should really occur within a specialist center. It needs to be timely, accurate, and definitive. So therefore, a center which has the ability to carry out motility testing and tissue assessment. Um, management at the current uh, time is largely supportive. You really, again, need a center with an ex expert multidisciplinary team able to offer key treatments of nutrition, uh, medical treatments like pharmacotherapy, uh, surgery, um, and then liaison with a transplantation service and management, and as per diagnosis, needs to follow a very strict uh, algorithm. So this is a devastating disease. There's lots to do. Lots of positive initiatives are required. Um, and with that, I thank you for your attention. And I will now leave you with Professor Benninger to answer the more difficult questions. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, did you receive the questions? No, I didn't. Okay, then, um, because I sent them to you, but then I will uh, read them out loud. It's no problem. First question, um, you recommended biopsies to be taken. Contrary to HD, ganglion cells are present. Are there any specific nervous anomalies that fit to pipocypo besides fibrotic mus muscle tissue? In Africa, Again, a non-HD... Oh, yes, sorry. That was the first part. Go on. No, I couldn't... Un I, can you please re uh, repeat the question? Yes. Um, are there any specific nervous anomalies that fit to pipocypo besides fibrotic muscle tissue? Um, well, that I always think it's a very difficult question because it depends on to which uh, laboratory you send your biopsies. Um, like Great Ormond Street, they have uh, special stainings to look for specific fibers, specific nerve fibers, specific uh, cells like the uh, interstitial cells of Cajal. Um, and um, other laboratories don't have these uh, um, expertise um, and well to be honest uh, we have sent many biopsies uh, to uh, for instance Great Ormond Street but in in the past to uh, to Belgium and we hardly found any abnormalities in these specific uh, biopsies so I find it very difficult to well in another way answer this question so we ask for abnormalities in whatever kind which might be associated with the uh, pseudo obstruction uh, but it's sometimes really difficult to find them. Okay, yeah, thank you. We got another question from Niklas Nieström, and he says, uh, the prevalence studies were performed before the 2018 PIPO criteria were made. The 2018 criteria could be considered more including. Do you agree that the prevalence numbers may actually be higher using the new criteria? We another very difficult uh, question because I, I really can't say that uh, we uh, because there are differences between adults and children. We thought it would be it would be helpful to make these criteria. Uh, 
like uh, Nikhil already said, we do still think it's a very rare disorder. Uh, and by just changing uh, the name of the entity, well, I doubt if it's it's more common. Uh, but you know, it's uh, it's very difficult to to perform these studies. Uh, and uh, Nikhil in the past tried to uh, collaborate with uh, many centers in Europe to uh, not only look at prevalence, but also collect uh, biopsies to see if we could find uh, abnormalities in the nerves of, uh, or in, in the muscles of these uh, children. Uh, and again, I, I think these studies are needed to indeed show if you are right, um, uh, if pseudoobstruction is a little bit more common than the prevalence data from uh, Japan and the United States. Yeah, thank you. Um, another very long question. Um, you mentioned abdominal pain is not often a presenting symptom. Do we see quite a lot of PIPO patients who have a lot of complaints such as discomfort and nausea? At the moment, we have a girl at the ward who has unknown progressive neurological disease, which has, uh, with episodes of severe abdominal pain without abdominal distension or increased stomach venting. Would you think this might be caused by PIPO or is this very unlikely? Okay, this, this is also a difficult question to answer because I, I really need to uh, see the, the total clinical picture. Uh, as Nikhil yeah. uh, discussed during his presentation, uh, you need some criteria to really uh, define it as a PIPO, uh, of which uh, distended uh, bowel loops are uh, in our opinion, the most important uh, symptoms, uh, uh, both uh, on, uh, on during your clinical work workup, but also uh, looking at the uh, um, uh, abdominal X-rays, for instance, um, because in this presentation he mentioned that abdominal pain is not that common. You know, it it, it really differs. We in, in our own hands, we we. We uh, did see children with uh, abdominal pain. And of course, you can imagine if you have uh, distended bowel loops that sometimes uh, you have uh, nausea, um, nausea as well. Um, but for this particular case, uh, well, it's too difficult for me to now diagnose it as a um, uh, pseudo obstruction. But again, please look at the criteria to define it as a pseudo obstruction and then it might fit. Thank you. Um, we have no, another question from uh, Vicky Wong. Um, what's the role of ileostomy and what kind of ileostomy is commonly created in pipe uh, Well, uh, I don't know what, uh, what, um, how to answer the question, what type of ileostomy, because uh, I, I'm not a surgeon. I, you know, I, I didn't know that there were differences in uh, performing a uh, ileostomy, but might be that one of the surgeons who hopefully are listening can answer this question better than I can. Uh, well, uh, the ileostomy is, um, has, to my opinion, two very important uh, reasons to make. Is one is uh, it will um, uh, it, it makes it more likely to vent the air, which is uh, it's is one of the main problems of pseudo obstructions. That's one. Uh, another thing is that um, in, in our hands, uh, those children who do have abdominal pain uh, might be helped by um, um, uh, not using uh, the colon. So in those cases, an ileostomy is also uh, very helpful. But um, it's uh, so the main is to to uh, to, to try to uh, to uh, get rid of the excessive air. Um, and uh, also, in some cases, it, it will improve abdominal pain. But again, the question about the, 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 the different ileostomies, I'm not able to, uh, to answer the question. Well, there's another question. Um, if you have any experience with using intraluminal decompression tube from a gas gastrostomy to ileostomy, which is changed every five or six months? Uh, no, we personally don't have, but we, uh, I, I don't, we don't have that uh, specific experience, but we use gastrostomies uh, in all our children. So we uh, tend to make the pack. Uh, in, uh, most of the children have an ileostomy. Uh, 
Uh, and I think in a rather big percentage of our population in the Netherlands, we uh, performed a colectomy because we th we uh, th saw that they um, had less pain after uh, the uh, colectomy. Uh, and I, if you look at the American data from uh, Columbus, Ohio, um, they uh, in many patients patients with uh, PPO, they indeed also removed the colon. Having said that, uh, in September this year, there will be the uh, World Congress of uh, Motility Disorders in Columbus, Ohio, uh, which, is, um, uh, uh, which is a very nice uh, uh, conference uh, for two or three days. And all these motility disorders will be discussed and highlighted during uh, the session in Columbus, Ohio. I think it's from s September 6th till September 9th or so. Uh, well, regarding the surgical question, we got Oliver Munster who um, responded to that. He says, okay. as a surgeon, I would avoid a loop ileostomy because they can prolapse proximally and distally. I would do an end ileostomy with a separate mucus fistula. Um, so thank you, Oliver. Um, and we, he also asked a question. Um, as a surgeon, we often get confronted to place stomas. As was said, these rarely solve the problem and are associated with a lot of morbidity. Are there any comparative studies that show there is a really benefit of getting a stoma? <laughs> no, there is not. And I fully agree that uh, many of these stomas give uh, many problems. Um, so that's in, in our hands exactly the same. We, are, we have experienced uh, pediatric surgeons who perform stomas for children with uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, but also for functional constipation. Uh, and uh, indeed in the, the children with uh, pseudo obstruction. But, um, um, well, if I uh, quote our data correctly, I think between 80 and 90% of the children indeed have stoma problems. So, uh, but again, uh, there are many problems with children with uh, pseudo obstruction. Uh, many, uh, and uh, although there is a high morbidity, most patients and parents are satisfied with having this stoma, but I fully agree that there are many problems with the stomas. Okay, well, Mark, thank you very much for your uh, answers. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please just send them to me and I will pass them forward um, via email. And for now, I would like, of course, Nikhil, and I would like to thank Mark for the, uh, answering the questions. And thank you at home all for joining us tonight. Um, the webinar has been recorded and will be available on both our GoTo webinar platform and the YouTube channel. And the links will be sent tomorrow. Um, finally, all of you who have attended today will receive a survey immediately after the session. And we would be very grateful if you could spend a few minutes filling it in to help us improve further sessions. And for now, I would like to wish you all a very good night. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.